you take your Bible there then, meet me in Luke in chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 will tell you a story that will serve as our foundation and our introduction this morning. I'm going to preach this message called, Did Jesus Really Come Into the World for Me? Across America right now, and because this happens across America, I can say it's happening across the world a lot of people are entertaining ideas about God that are limited. They're trying to paint Him as a limited God. They cause people who believe it to think that God, in my view, is much smaller than He really is. People today are saying that God doesn't love everyone. Some are saying that Jesus didn't die on the cross for everyone. Some are saying that not everyone can even believe in His Son. Is it true? If it is, then we could view ourselves maybe in the cold outer darkness of all that God says about us. I mean, what would really matter? If there were such a list and such an eternal decree, and you're not on that list, why on earth would God even matter? Why on earth for you would it even be important when someone says God created? Why would you choose in your life not to believe the lies of evolution? After all, if God doesn't love you, what difference does it make who created the earth? Or if Jesus really didn't die for you, maybe on the cross, why on earth would you be interested in Jesus as a person or praying to His Father? What difference would any of that make? If, well, how can you know if you're on that list? You can't. You can't. You can make a guess and you can consider your whole Christian life to be a, a, experimental. That is, if you put yourself under experiment and you say, I think I believed in Him, and if He died for me, and if He loves me, and if I keep it up long enough, then I can know that I'm saved. When would you know it? Well, I can't and never will, but after I die, after my final breath, maybe you could assume then that I was saved because I always lived a holy life. I'm trying not to exaggerate this. I don't want to inject any Hollywood into my sermons. You might think it pretty incredible that I would introduce a message with such thoughts like those. Maybe you've never heard them before. Hang around and you will because this is running rampantly through the churches in America. And in my experiences overseas, when America sneezes theologically, the rest of the world's preachers get the flu. So these ideas are about and around and they're probably coming through your ears and so we want to be a step ahead of the train ride. I'm, we want to be prepared. We want to know what, what the Bible says about that. So let's do this message called, Did Jesus Really Come Into the World for Me? Luke and chapter 19. Here's a story that you know. We'll uh, hit the high spots of it. This won't be a verse-by-verse -verse treatment of it, but let's get the gist of this great connection between this man Zacchaeus and Jesus. Verse 1, Luke 19, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. That means tax collectors. He's a tax collector. Don't you love those people? Well, he might be an unpopular breed of person, but at least he's rich. How about that? So here's an unpopular guy, but he has the money. Now, a tax collector would never, ever abuse the position. Do you believe that? There is abuse, and Zacchaeus seems pretty forthright, and pretty honest about the fact that he's made a lot of money by being a tax collector. Verse 3, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. So Zacchaeus, uh, he's challenged, okay? He has obstacles. Number one, he's rich, and you know what Jesus once even said about the rich, it's 
Hard for a rich man, huh? It's hard for a rich man. Why? Because it's more easy for them to trust in riches than it is to trust in the Son of God. So that's not to say that a wealthy person can't be saved into eternal life. But there may be an obstacle for that person who's affluent, who always has enough. There's always an answer. There's never a lack of material goods to not put his faith into Christ, huh? So he has that against him. He has another thing. He's short. Are you a short person? God bless short people. Zacchaeus was one. And he wants to see G. He wants to see who he is. He's obviously got a lot on his mind on this day. And I think, as a result of looking at this content, I think he's had a lot on his mind before this day. I think he planned this out. This is premeditated seeking of Jesus Christ. He's trying to measure Jesus to see who He really is. Well, there's only one reason really anyone wants to seek out Jesus to see who He really is, huh? Because someone thinks, that man might better my position. Is that good? Is that good? That's why you, is that good? That's why you would seek the Lord. That's why you want to study Jesus. That's why you want to find out who He is. Because underlying, there's a thought. Who He is, if He is who some say He is, that might help me out. And so Zacchaeus wants to know this rich man who's an unpopular tax collector, but he can't get to see Jesus because there are too many people around. Verse 4, And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Is that great? Isn't that great? While someone else might have been crying on the side, whining about how life has dealt them lemons. There's Zacchaeus going up that sycamore tree. I've loved this story since I was a boy, and my grandfather cut down a sycamore tree. Buddy, I played on that stump for days. Because that stump is in the Bible. This is the kind of tree Zacchaeus climbed up. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was. Mm-hmm. You liked it too, didn't you? And so up the tree, the short rich man goes to find out who Jesus really is. Five, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Does it sound to you like that's the first time Jesus ever thought about Zacchaeus? Does it sound to you like Jesus got to that spot, there's someone came along and put an X in the road, X marks the spot, and at that point Jesus said, hmm, I think I'll look up and see if there might be somebody in this tree. Or has Jesus already, in fact, known and thought about Zacchaeus? Oh, he already has Zacchaeus on his mind. Verse 6, and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. You ought to underline that little phrase, received him joyfully. And you can write beside verse number 6, Zacchaeus is saved by now. He's already received him joyfully. That's faith, ladies and gentlemen. Zacchaeus from the sycamore tree got all the look he needed to rest his faith in the fact that Jesus is more than enough to help my position. He's rested his faith in Christ. Look at Jesus' announcement. Verse number 7, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's make some points here that are important. Number one, Zacchaeus is saved by his faith in Christ. He's not saved because he paid back spoiled money. Hmm? I expected a big, a, a big old amen from that. Money could never help anyone to be saved into eternal life. Money is not the price for sin. Money has never been asked for by God as a way to give restitution for things that we've done wrong. Nor is confession of sins. 
by the way. Uh, many people seem to believe that in order to be saved, into eternal, you have to confess every sin that you've ever done. Is that true? Listen, not only is that not true, that's not even possible. Could you imagine, I mean, just looking at you, how many sins you have. Well, Freddie, we're looking at you too. Okay, good, then we agree together. You and I could never be saved by confessing all our sins. Was Zacchaeus required to do that? You know, Jesus hasn't said a single word to him about paying anybody back. But he's saved because he saw what he was looking for. He's satisfied that now he can freely place his faith into this one. Now he has all the answers he needs to satisfy faith alone in Christ alone. But now he goes and does a great thing that a believer in Jesus ought to do. Is that good? Is that good? He he knows he's done some criminal things, so he goes and makes things right that he can, and that's good. It doesn't save, but that's the kind of thing that a saved person ought to do. Don't you agree with that? All right, so now Jesus says, this day is salvation come to this house. Jesus knew all about Zacchaeus, didn't he? So, in fact, we could say, as a result of this story, that Zacchaeus was not seeking Jesus, but Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. that good? Isn't it great when those two things intersect? And as you know, that very thing has happened in your life too, if today your faith has rested in Jesus. Maybe all along in your life you thought, yeah, I did this and this and that was bad and I did that and that was bad and I did that and that was bad. In fact, it all was bad, but then I just decided I got to have something better. Maybe that, and so I began seeking God. But you know that before you ever sought God, that He was seeking you. Yeah, look at verse number 10. Here's the statement. This is the reason that I wanted to come to this passage. This is the purpose statement of why Jesus came into the world. Look, for the Son of Man is come to seek, to seek. That's what He does. That's what Jesus foremost does as He comes into the world. When they put His holy head in the hay of a manger, probably in a stable or a barn, Jesus is on a mission Is he on a mission only for a certain few people that he decided before he ever built Mars that he's going to save those people whether they like it or not? Or did he come in fact to save a lot of people? In fact, sinner people, he would say. The people here criticized him when he told Zacchaeus, "I'm I'm going to spend the day with you. But the people didn't, they didn't throw any flowers out on the ice rink to Zacchaeus, did they? They didn't say, Zacchaeus, you're the man. Woo, yeah, you got Jesus coming to your house. Wouldn't you like it that people were that kind of natured? Wouldn't you like it when people always lift up one another? They always are hopeful, are positive people. Don't we need more positive people in the world who are saying, well, good for you. That's good. No, no, they looked at it. They said, that's bad. That's bad. Zacchaeus is bad. Jesus is bad too. Because Jesus is going to spend all his time with sinners. Uh, If Jesus is going to eat breakfast with anybody, he's going to eat breakfast with sinners. Is that good? Let me tell you what. He's welcome at my house. He's welcome whenever I'm eating a biscuit to eat it with me, a sinner. But people are always negative. People are always down. Zacchaeus is bad. And look at Jesus going to eat at a bad man's house. If he'd come to your house, Bubba, he'd be eating with sinners too. But Zacchaeus will not simply be known as a sinner, will he? He'll be a sinner saved by grace through faith. Is that good? Is that good? What a great story. But don't miss, don't miss the anchor of the whole story. It's verse 10. That the Son of Man is come to seek. And did you know He was seeking you? God seeking you. You must be pretty important to Him. 
Freddie, I'm a sinner. I know. That's why it's so important that we keep this balanced. Okay? That we keep this balanced. The fact that God was seeking you, the fact that Jesus came to embrace the mission of seeking and saving that which was lost, does not mean that you are so wonderful in yourself that you just, you just deserve God. You are His kind of... Per- You're not His kind of person. You're a sinner kind of person. We're the only kind. But this exalts the love of God. This exalts the sovereignty of God that He looks down to the little blue planet and He loves everybody on that planet and He goes on this rescue mission that He would pursue after people to seek and to save them that are lost. Now, look into this verse, verse number 10, and tell me, is there anyone then that Jesus was not seeking to save? No! Because there's one kind of person that has populated that blue planet. Those kinds of people who are lost from God, because why? They're sinners. He's holy, they're not. He's holy in a holy heaven that's absolutely perfect. They don't belong there. But God loves them all, loves them all. And you, friend, are included in the people that Jesus Christ came to seek. You may not be in a sycamore tree today, although if you climb one this afternoon, I'll applaud you. But wherever you are, whatever you're doing, Whoever you cheated, whatever wrong that you've done, there's a fact on the table in front of us today. God loves you just the way you are. He loves you before you do a thing to pay anybody back. He loves you before you begin the long confessional of all your sins that will never be completed, because you don't have that kind of knowledge now. But He loves you before. He loves you before. Before you ever had a dawning light bulb about the knowledge of God, God already had a knowledge of you, and He loved you before. I hope this makes you feel today a different way. A different way towards God, a different way towards you. A different way towards the people that are around you. Good people and bad. I mean that in the way they treat you. I hope you think differently of your life, your reason, your purpose, because of this underlying statement, Jesus Christ came into this world to seek you and to save you when you were lost. Did Jesus really come into the world for me? Yes. Yes. He came for you. This unstoppable love of God was intended for your benefit. You'd have to buy a ticket to get away from the love of God. Let's look at some more scriptures. Join me over to the right, John chapter 3. John and chapter 3. How about Zacchaeus? Can't wait to meet him. John chapter 3. Here's another character that comes from the page of the Bible. Very different than Zacchaeus. Here's Nicodemus. We don't know how tall Nicodemus is, but we know he was well-dressed. He was a man of stature. He was on the Sanhedrin of Israel. He's the equivalent of a modern-day senator. He's dressed in holy-looking robes, and he comes to Jesus all alone and at night. They call him a master of Israel. If you have a question about God... Nicodemus was a likely person that you would go and ask your question because he's a master in God matters. But there he is appearing to God at night under the cover of darkness to have this great conversation with Jesus. I want you to look at one verse here, the verse just after verse 16. And look at this purpose. For God sent not His Son into the world. Stop right there. Here's a negative statement. Okay? The subject of that first line of verse 17 is God sent His Son into the world. 
God sent His Son into the world. But He did not send Him for this reason. He didn't send Him for what reason? To condemn the world. Okay, are you a part of that world? In Luke 19 verse 10, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. We were a part of those lost people. huh? Well, here we are in John 3, 17, and the group is called the world. Well, that's your group and mine. So we know that Jesus came into that world full of people. Every one of them was a sinner, separated from God, not, de- not uh, even in any position whatsoever to think that somehow they would merit heaven. But there is Jesus appearing, and He did not come into the world by the Father to condemn us. Is that good? Is that good? A lot of people feel condemned by God. Now, if we were on justice, we would deserve to be condemned, huh? We would be condemned. If there is only what's right, if there is only what's fair, we all get condemned, and that's the end of the story. Remember God in the garden told Adam, for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. He ate it. If he dies completely and by every measure of what death means, okay, he's a greasy spot in the garden, that's all. Okay, we can go on about life. Everything is fair and right in the world, except for this, that God so loved the world. And in the love of God, God didn't simply want to end the story before it ever began. There won't be a greasy spot of Adam's death in the garden when God took His holy thumb and pushed him into non-existence. But there will be the love of God and the beginning of this great story about God's rescue mission. The prolegomena that God will seek after those who are at enmity with God. That God will pursue them. The story is not that we pursued God. How could a sinner do that? But that God the Holy pursued after us. And this is the story of the Bible. Take note, verse 17, He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Purpose statement, John 3, 17, God sent His Son into the world that the world through Him might be saved. Is that good? Is that good? You a part of the world? Then Jesus came to save you. Is that good? Is that good? I hope this changes your outlook on God. hope this changes your outlook on you. And I hope this will cause you to put a filter in front of your eyes that you can look at the purpose of your life in a different way. That you can look at people around you in a different way because of the truth of this. That those people who are in this world, it seems, for one reason at all, to be a thorn in your flesh, a burr under your saddle, are really not in charge of writing your story. Your life does not have to be about those people. Hmm. Your life is about you and the God who pursued you out of pure love. And that God came after you when you had nothing to offer Him and He offered you everlasting Life with God. This will put the coming of a new year in a whole new perspective, won't it? I mean, this is important to who I am. This is important to why I'm here. This is important in my family. This is important to the people who know me. That I don't deserve it, but I have been picked by God to be the object of His love. At no merit, no merit of my own. Is that good? Is that good? So this is why in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews can say to those who had put their faith into Jesus and were being persecuted for it, he could say, hey, before this time, 
They were persecuting you. They were giving you affliction, but you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Knowing that in heaven, you have something a lot better than these goods you have on earth. And if your goods that you have on earth are spoiled, why should you really cry over spilled milk? When you know full well that by the loving pursuit of Almighty God, you now have a place in heaven forever. This puts a whole new perspective on what I'm trying to do, on where I'm trying to go, on what I want to accomplish, because I'm significant to God. Leave John chapter 3, meet me 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy now in chapter 2. Did Jesus really come into the world for me? Oh yeah, you better believe He did, because we have God's Word on it. 1 Timothy now in chapter 2, pick it up, verse number 3. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So there's Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19. He wants to come to the knowledge of the truth about who Jesus is. Okay, but what was God's thought about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, you're climbing a tree to seek who I really am. But I'll go hang on a tree for you, Zacchaeus. I'll hang by the nails, Zacchaeus, to show you that I have loved you, Zacchaeus, with an everlasting love that will drive me to cash in my life to love you, a sinner. Because God didn't come into the world to condemn the lost, but this is why He came. Because it's His will that all men would be saved, verse 4, and come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Mediator means, said in a simple way, a go-between. There's one God, but God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, down into the world to be the go-between who will stand between sinner man and holy God. And He'll do His business to mediate, to moderate, to reconcile the world unto Himself. To make the world savable to God as the two face off, one a sinner, the other a holy. But the sinner will be savable Because the sin has been taken away by the mediator who cleared the table of all our sins. Is that good? Is that good? And in order to to mediate between God and man, then the barrier had to be removed. Verse 6, who gave himself, who gave himself. You can't give any more than that. He gave himself a ransom what? A ransom for a few people that God picked out before He ever built the earth and called it the eternal decree. Is this teaching from the Bible? Or is this teaching, in fact, not Bible doctrine, not theological, systematic theology, but a philosophy of man? Is it a philosophy that says, God couldn't be that good? Because He's so sovereign, because He's so powerful, He couldn't be good enough. He's got to measure His love and only a certain people get it. Otherwise, God's not in charge. No, we believe God is in charge, don't we? It's just that under the charge of God, it happens to be true of Him that He is so of love that His love goes to everybody. 
God doesn't have to show His power by only giving His love to a few. If you think God has to show Himself powerful by only loving a few, it's only because you don't understand how big the love of God is. And the Bible over and over, the Bible writers are falling all over themselves to show us He's loving all the sinners. He's loving the whole world. And that's all of us. So you feel good about that, buddy. You short little Zacchaeus. You little criminal you. God loves you. And there's not one thing you can do to stop it. He loved you before. You don't have to buy it. You can't change it. How? How did He love the world? That He gave His only begotten Son. That Jesus Christ, the mediator, gave Himself. How bad do you want it? Ask that question of Jesus Christ if you could, and He'll stretch out His arms and say, I want it this much. The salvation of all men. This is how much I want it. God will never force people into heaven. God will never force people into harmony with God. God shows the correct way. God relentlessly tells the truth. He shows the correct path to take. And God graciously graciously stands aside and allows man to choose. But God has planned for all people to be savable. That all people have an avenue to God. The avenue is called faith alone. In Christ alone. You could choose. If you'd like. Zacchaeus wanted it. So did I. Don't know where I'd be without it. But I know I'm saved because I'm a whosoever that believeth in Him. How about you? If you're not saved, you could be. Freddie, I don't think I can make everything right. Well, I agree. You can't. But Jesus did. John the Baptist said of him one day, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1.29 See, some people think, well, I could never make it right. I could never turn from all my sins. Jesus is not asking you to turn from all your sins in order to get heaven. Because Jesus has taken away your sin. A lot of preaching goes to unsaved people and tells them, turn from all your sin, get everything right, live a holy way, and maybe God will save you. That's so hopeless, that's so helpless, that's so unbiblical, that's so wrong. Why spend all my time telling unsaved people to turn from their sin when Jesus died for their sin? When Jesus is the Lamb of God who took away all their sin. You know who needs to turn from their sin? You know who I want to teach to turn from sin? Save people. Because now they have the Holy Spirit of God inside to give them power to turn from sin. But turning from sin as a way to be saved is a frustration of the grace of God. If you could turn from all your sin in order to help God save you, then why does God call your salvation grace? So it's an absurd idea that we could help God save us by trying to be holy people. We're all for holy people, but first they got to be believers. Who then, like Zacchaeus, decided, well, if this is true, I ought to live in such a way to bring glory to that God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 And verse 6, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You know what? I want to testify of it now. Jesus gave His life a ransom for me. Is that good? That's my testimony. My testimony is not, I was a bad boy and I became a good boy. Look at me now. Therefore, I'm saved. Why? Because I'm good? Are you kidding me? What a horrible way to share a testimony. 
Our only right testimony to be testified of Jesus Christ is, I am a sinner not fit for God, but God loved me. Came to seek and save that which was lost. Gave Himself a ransom for my sin and died for me. Rose from the dead. He loved me before I ever did a thing for Him that was good. And my testimony is I'm saved by His grace only through faith alone in Jesus, the Savior and mediator of my life. Let 1 Timothy go. Meet me, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter in chapter 2. Over in the back, I made it all to the right for you. Past Hebrews now, 1 Peter in chapter 2. And pick it up in verse number... 24. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins. Stop right there, soak that in. Who his own self bear our sins. I want this to make you feel differently about you, differently about God. Differently about why you're here, your purpose in life, why you get a new year with 365 days in it. Did God beat you to it? God planned before. God loved the unlovely and paid a ransom for it. That's why He came to seek and save that which was lost. So Peter, the old fisherman, writes it, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Greeting card company says, if you care about sending the best, send one of our cards. After all, they only cost $8.50. Well, I think if you care a lot, there's more that you could do than send a card with words. But you hang your body on a cross by nails. And that will communicate your endless love like no words ever could. God so loved the world, He didn't send a card. He sent His Son. He didn't send... Somebody else to die. Someone from the outside. He sent Himself. In His own body He felt the nails. In His own body He bore the sin. That's awesome. I hope it makes you view yourself that this man died for you. There was a pilot named Johnny. Johnny joined the Air National Guard, became a very advanced pilot that would fly in demonstrations on special days with airports and crowds. Johnny was a part of a formation one day and they would make a cross in the eye and then they would hit the smoke jets and make a cross of smoke in the sky. Tens of thousands of people below watching them display what they could do with a set of airplanes in the sky. But the captain of their squad looked behind him and saw Johnny's plane in smoke that didn't belong in the cross. It was an engine that had lost power. He said, I watched Johnny fight his controls. And as that plane began to lose altitude and Johnny could do little to affect the fight of that plane, he came down in a place called Fairfield, Ohio into a neighborhood when his plane. There was a man out in his yard on that day and he looked into the sky and he saw that airplane and he was helpless to do a single thing. The following day's newspaper, the man said this, I could see that man in that airplane. He was fighting his controls. And I watched him fight that airplane to lift it over my head and crash it into the ground. He said this, 
that man died for me. That would be his testimony. To that man, Johnny, this man would testify for the rest of his life. That man died for me. That's my testimony too. I am who I am. I am what I am. I am, period. Because that man, Jesus, died. He came to seek me. He came to save me. Because I was lost. I owed a price that was too much to pay. He paid it all at once on the cross. He loved you. He planned for you. He's seeking you. How about that? In this following week, a lot of people make resolutions. Most of them will be completely of the flesh. Here's why. There's a new year on my calendar. Therefore, I'm not going to do so and so. That's not going to give you any power to not do so and so because it says 2020 on your check and not 2019. The power to make some surrender, to make some commitment, to make some change, the power is in realizing who I am with God. And with God, all things are possible. In our flesh, probably not going to be able to profit a thing by making a list of New Year's resolution because the calendar is going to say 2020 and not 2019. The power would come from God. And I hope you will embrace a new year in this way. I'm somebody in 2020 because God came to seek and save me. And He did because I put my faith in Jesus. Therefore, I have a purpose in life that's rooted and based in the love of God that He has made me somebody new. And I'm going to put somebody new on display for the world to see what the grace of God can do. Let that hand be you. Let my wallet be our sin. You and I are in the same boat. There we are. There's our sin. Let that hand represent God. He loves you, hates your sin, but He loves you. The Bible said He loved you so much that He took on flesh, Jesus Christ, God with the skin on Him, came down into the world full of sinners to pay a ransom for all of them. He took our sin, He bare our sins in His own body on the tree. Paid a death penalty for all sins of all people in all time and places. All of it got paid by that death of the Son of God. Three days later, He rose from the dead that the whole world could know they are savable. They've been sought. And you could have everlasting life with God by believing in Him. It's by faith in Jesus. It's by trusting in Him. And nothing else. You can't help him with money. You can't help him with membership or promise to try harder or do better or never mess up again. No, no. It's not on you. It fell on him. And he got a job done out of his love and grace. It'll be everlasting life for you by believing, by merely believing in that man to give you eternal life. Would you bow your head in the building with me wherever you are? You could have everlasting life. You could know it today. You need not ever doubt it again. There need be no confusion at all. All sin of yours fell on Christ. He welcomed it when He bare it in His own body. And this moment offers everlasting life. If you have it, would you thank Him for it? If you want it right now, believe Him for it. And you'll be born into a new family, the family of God, never ever to be cast out. Heads bowed, eyes closed in the building. Would you raise a hand right now to let me know, Freddie, I understood a moment ago I took Jesus to be my Savior. You can put it right back down, not trying to corner you after the meeting or anything that would embarrass you. Just like to know. If you belong to Him, could you say a prayer to the Lord? Lord, this must be my purpose. To testify of the grace that bought me. Make my life count no matter what year it is. To the glory of the one who has sought me and saved me by his grace. Lord, thanks and bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.